one more point so I seem slightly nicer than you. <laughs> it, this is about the only time that you've given a higher score than I have in anything. Bloop, boop, boop. Bloop, doop, doop. Bloop, doop, doop, doop. <laughs> Hey there, all you crazy cats and critters, and welcome back to another room like you'll be in here, yo. Thank you for being here, folks. Today, we are doing another video game review of one of my all-time favorites, Earthbound. I think we should just jump right in. Um, we figure most people know this game, but as this is fairly easily available on, on GBA, it's on one of the Game Boys, and it's also available on Switch. We want to keep this mostly spoiler-free in case there's somebody who hasn't played this. They can maybe decide if they want to or not. It's on the virtual console. I did not play it on that. I played it on original hardware with the Game Genie because this game is hard and I cheated a little bit, but not too much. <laughs> Let's start by talking about the story. We both gave this all fives in the story category. So, okay, we didn't give it all fives, but pretty close to all fives in the story category. But I think what's interesting about this game is that the story is not actually that important, I don't think. I think it's more about like the vibes, as cheesy as it is to say that, but this game is kind of all about the vibes and how everything makes you feel. It's a pretty standard story. You collect the things so you can beat the big bad, but it's sort of like the way that the story unfolds and all of the heart that's in it, that's important. Yeah, I think that this story sort of gives truth to the lie of the idea of substance over style, because the substance, like you said, is similar to many games. If you replace this game's collect it with Pokemon badges, it's really not that different except the stakes are much higher because in Pokemon you're not saving the world like you are here. But I think what makes this story so special is more in the way that it's told and in the way that the characters and the setting are all simultaneously a little absurd and yet understated. You know, they really take the silent protagonist idea and multiply it, and yet each character feels real even though there's so little dialogue, there's so much heart in each character. Even though this game's story in some ways is cliche, there's also something that's really beautifully subtle about it. And I think there's there's certain times that a cliche can be comforting. Like, I know what's going on here, and it's sort of nice to not expect big, huge, dramatic twists in the story. It's warm, it's kind of comforting, but it's also really, like, charming and witty and funny. And really, there are big, dramatic twists in the story. I don't want to give any spoilers, but the things that happen to these characters are not things that happen to characters in other JRPGs. Death is often used in more well-known JRPGs, such as Final Fantasy VII, as a way of really heightening the drama. Death is not used as much in this game. It happens a little bit, but really the trauma these characters experience is more varied and understated than death. And I think that what's cool about that is that it leaves more ends open for the story that it's that is being told. Like, if, if someone dies, I mean, yeah, we're now all sad, but then that story of that character is just kind of over. But if someone gets transfigured the way these characters get transfigured, for instance, that really leads your brain to question more. And I, you know, going with this idea, I think the other thing that makes this story so cool is that there are so many things that are left half answered or unanswered that the player is sort of forced to use their imagination to fill in the gaps. That's it for story then, I guess. So let's move on to the characters and we can talk about the heroes specifically first. What are your thoughts on the heroes? I really like that the heroes are all silent protagonists. I don't normally like silent protagonists in games, but in this one, I think it works in the game's favor because it leaves things open for the player to have all the reactions that the characters should be having. There are so many moments in this game where something jaw-dropping happens and you're expecting the, the protagonists, you know, because it's a Japanese game, to have some kind of anime reaction like, what? That's crazy! And they just sort of stand there. 
what I like about that is that it lets the story speak for itself. You know, sometimes anime games, and anime in general, I guess I should say, it can feel a little patronizing the level to which the characters react to things. Like, I really don't need your eyeballs to literally be bigger than your head to know that something's shocking. I I heard you when you did the thing. I saw it, I was watching, I was paying attention, I'm okay. And I love that about these games because I feel like I'm more part of the story. I mean, there's, there's something that happens in the final boss battle that I don't want to give away, but anyone who's played this game probably knows exactly what I mean when I say that it makes you feel directly involved. But I don't think that you feel directly involved only because of that. I think it's because the whole time, the game has kind of subtly been string, stringing you along. Ness never has any lines, so he's a textbook silent protagonist. Paula, Jeff, and Pooh all occasionally have some lines, but they're still functionally silent protagonists. And usually those lines are just like when they meet the party. Like when Pooh meets the party, he's like, hello, I'm joining your quest. And that's right. and aren't they like inf information giving lines more than emotional lines? Yes. Paula does have a few more emotional lines. Like when you meet her, she's like, I knew I would meet you type of thing. And she goes on a little tiny speech about that. After that introduction to her character, we don't really hear a lot of her speaking about it until the ending credits, when she does have some more specific things to say. Getting specifically into the characters here, I love Ness. I love that he feels so ordinary, despite the fact that, you know, he has psychic powers and that's really cool. And each of the characters, even though they feel distinct, somehow also feel that ordinary. Even Pooh, who feels, I guess, the most, for lack of a better word, exotic. You know, in Pooh's part of the world, Pooh's just the guy. You know, like he's just learning the meditation thing. He's just doing the stuff. The only character I think I struggle with a little bit, and I gave her a higher grade than I probably should, is Paula. Only because she does feel like she doesn't have as many relationships as the other ones do, or, or maybe not as many. Maybe the better way of saying it is, is her relationships, they're less of a driving factor in her story. Ness is like silent protagonist, but also like every man in a way, which is a silent protagonist usually is the every man type character in some way. But even in battle mechanics, Ness has the strongest physical attack for most of the game and then has an attack spell. Then everything else is like supportive healing spells. So he sort of like does everything. But then when Pooh shows up, Pooh also does everything slightly better than Ness. Pooh's attack is higher. Pooh's got almost as much magic attack as Paula. Like Paula has one spell that Pooh doesn't have. And then Pooh also has really good healing spells. It's sort of like Ness kind of gets left behind or a little bit of the game. But then when you find all the things that you need to find throughout the game, Ness bumps up to then being the most powerful of them. And I think that's actually kind of kind of cool and how the gameplay fits into telling the story in that way. With most of the characters, we know who they are based on what other people say about them. But basically the only thing we hear anyone say about Paula is that she's like this perfect little girl. Yeah, I think that Paula suffers from some of the same problems that many female characters in this era of role play, console role-playing games suffer from. Either they're the, you know, perfect female warrior who has no problems at all and is just good at everything, which Paula has a little bit, um, or they are the token, which, like the Nina in Breath of Fire. They don't really have much personality beyond being female characters. In case anyone wants to push back on Nina. Yeah, Nina is really boring and has no personality in the first game, but in the rest of them, she has really strong personalities. But the, your point is still like token female, yeah. I really like the villains in this game. There aren't many of ma many main villains, but the ones who are there are excellent. I like Gygus as a villain. He's kind of the archetype of evil. He doesn't really have much of a character beyond evil. I just love his character design and how alien he feels. Sometimes I really hate the villain that is just like the unknowable evil presence, but sometimes it really works. I gave Gygax four out of five. The reasoning for that is just that like, I wanted a little bit more direct interaction with Gygax earlier in the game 
to like give us more of a teaser to who Gygus was. We only really hear who Gygus is from the people who work for Gygus. It's still not enough for me to dislike the character as a villain. I still think he's great. And I love Pokey because Pokey is the type of villain we all know. I mean, everybody know, has a Pokey in their life. It's the same reason why I like the protagonists, because so much of this world feels so real, and not just because there are cars and telephones, but because the character flaws you're seeing are character flaws we all know way too well. And because Pokey was generated by the same forces that we know real life Pokies are generated by, and he's appalling to the very end. Even in the moments when he is made more sympathetic by the very end, you still, like, don't really want to sympathize with him because he brought it upon himself. He's just the villain that you love to hate. Yeah, I think Pokey is great because like a lot of the best written villains, he's not evil for evil's sake. Like, he's not just doing this because it's fun or something, but also the reasons that he is evil don't excuse his evil, they just explain it. Pokey's parents are terrible. They're really, really bad parents. They're abusive physically and emotionally and verbally, and they're obsessed with money and stature and status and things like that. Part of that then has rubbed off onto Pokey, who sees that Ness, the boy next door, is much more well-liked by everybody. And so then decides that he will do whatever he can to get a one-up on Ness. And he will stoop to some very low lows to get there. I feel like a lot of our real-life villains in current day life are basically that. <laughs> you could maybe forgive him near the beginning of the game, but he helps out the baddies quite a lot to the point where by the end you're like, Pokey, you could have stopped this. I don't care about your trauma. I don't care who didn't teach you not to do this. You're a rational human being and you could have done something and you didn't. And I think like case in point, like Picky didn't, <laughs> you know, Pokey's brother Picky is not a bad guy. The NPCs are sort of where this game's writing shines because all of the NPCs, even down to like the simplest, like old lady walking in the street, they all have such personalities to them. It's often kind of weird writing, like it's weird for the sake of being funny often, but I don't mind in this game because it just like adds to the general weird atmosphere of the game. So I need like specific NPCs. The ones that I really want to highlight are Ness's immediate family. Ness has a younger sister named Tracy, who's fine. Like I don't really have any huge problems with her. She's a little weird, but again, the game is weird. But Ness's parents are kind of amazing. It's sort of unclear what the relationship between Ness's mom and Ness's dad is. And I think that's great. You never see Ness's dad. You only ever talk to him on the phone. And he's very supportive, but then occasionally has like a little dig about Ness's mom saying like, oh, you like to work too hard just like your mother, but I don't think it's good to work too hard. Meanwhile, he's the one who's not there. Ness's mom is so supportive and so nurturing, and she's just like the perfect media <laughs> mom. What I like about all the characters really is that the good guys are all lovable, even though they still have flaws that are inexcusable. Like Ness's dad is supportive, but it's still not okay that he's so absent from his kid's life. And there's no good excuse for that. And the game doesn't beat you over the head with that either. Like we don't have a huge emotional monologue from Ness about how much he wishes his dad was here. Again, I really feel like the, the game makers respect me as a player to let me do that work on my own, if I want to. And yeah, like how many people who have played this game can relate to an absent parent? Like an absent parent who, yeah, loves you and will tell you that, but they're, but they're not there. <laughs> right, and I think what makes this game work when some other games that have had a modern setting don't work as well, it's not demanding that I feel a certain way about anything. It's like, here's the circumstances, and yeah, we made it purposefully really real, but that's all we're gonna give you. I just wanna say that Buzz Buzz is great, and we can't really say why Buzz Buzz is so great without giving it away, but Dr. Andonuts is a really interesting character. Uh, Dr. Andonuts is Jeff's dad, who is also kind of estranged, and when Jeff meets Dr. Andonuts, after however long they've been apart, Dr. Andonuts doesn't recognize him. He's like, who are you? 
Oh, you're my son? Oh, you've gotten so big. And Jeff has just, just has to deal with this. <laughs> Tony is Jeff's roommate at the boarding school, and they have a very close relationship. At first, it's like lightly hinted that it's more than just they're very good friends. But then as the game goes on, you get like more and more. Like he'll call you on the phone and be like, hey, how's Jeff doing? I just miss him so much. <laughs> you get a letter from Tony at the very end of the game. And it is so very blatant that at least Tony has some very strong feelings for Jeff. We don't know if Jeff reciprocates them. Normally, I dig on games when they don't just make queer relationships blatant. But I think it actually works in this game's favor because, first of all, they're underage. And not just, you know, 16. I, I read all these characters as like 10 to 12. I teach elementary school. I wouldn't want to hear that my 10-year-olds are dating each other. But that is right around the age when you start to maybe have some of those feelings if you haven't already. Then we get into like one of the big tricky spots of this game, which are the points of diversity and gender balance, which are tricky spots in most of the games that we've covered, basically all of the games that we've covered on this channel. To me, it's always like, how do you feel about it comparing it to par for the course versus where we could be and where we should be at this time versus how we feel about this now. So it's always sort of a tricky thing. But when it comes to gender, every single female character in this game is wearing a dress or a skirt. Also, with the exception of Paula, every female character is there because she's directly related to a male character. We do have various like secretaries and stuff who have minimally important roles. There's Venus, the singer Venus, and there's the money grubbing director of the theater that Venus sings at. Still, it's they're the most stereotypical female roles. Yeah, and I'll give you the director and Venus, but I won't give you the secretaries because they're related to the male employers, yeah. even if they're not, you know, family. I will also give this game a bit of a similar pass to other games regarding diversity in general, because at this time, the general populace wasn't as educated on issues of diversity as we are, most of us are today. Also, it's worth noting that Japan, where this game was made, is far less racially and ethnically diverse than, say, America. But I'm still not willing to give it a pass on gender equity. Because you know what? Japan has the ladies. But also, this game essentially takes place in the US. There's the black and brown people. So there are a couple black and brown NPCs who just wander around the town. So we know they exist, but none of them have names. None of them have important roles. Many of them are sort of harmful stereotypes, like when you get to the desert. Even at this point, I think we could be doing better, but it's also like comparing it against what everyone else was doing in games at this time. It's like, everyone was bad, so should we? But yeah, it's right. a tough thing that I always wrestle with with this. Yeah. I don't really have a ton to say about graphics. In a game from this era, we're using sprite-based graphics, and I think often sprite-based graphics age better than 3D renderings and polygons and stuff like that. I think this game is just so nice to look at, and whenever there is a cutscene of anything, it's all happening in-engine, so it doesn't look like it's too out of place compared to what else is going on around it. So I, I, yeah, I gave the graphics perfect scores all the way through. Yeah, and I also think, again, the, these graphics work well within that understated mold. I love the design of these game, of this game and, and the cities and everything. The only places where I gave poor marks in design were Paula, because as we've kind of alluded to, she feels like the every woman. She has a pink dress, and I'm, I don't remember if she has a bow or not. She does. She has yeah. a red bow like, in her hair. I mean... She's basically Miss Pac-Man in sprite form. I gave Jeff a lower mark just because besides the bow tie, he feels kind of typical nerdy kid to me. I gave Tracy low marks for the same reason as um, Paula. But otherwise, I just love that most of these characters feel like people you could meet on the street. I love that the cities simultaneously feel big and explorable and yet so simple. Like... So many of the buildings look the same as other buildings, which is true of real life cities. I love that cars can just be driving on the street. And I love that even though you have that, you also have, again, these very alien characters, Gygus, Mr. Saturn, the robots later on. This game does a good job of starting you in this very simple place. And yeah, you do meet the aliens right away, but then besides that, it just kind of branches out 
until by the end it's it's like the most abstract. Another thing that I really love about the design of this game, specifically with the monster design, some of these monsters can be like described as these horrible, hideous things. And then you see their actual design in battle and they're all really cute. <laughs> like, I love how cute this game is in its design. There are monsters that you fight at some point that are street signs, like, speed limit signs that have come to life and are attacking you and they just look goofy and it's so fun you fight trees <laughs> you fight like crows and dogs and snakes and stuff that have just like suddenly gotten angry there's a monster in this game called the mad duck and it's one of my favorite designs in any game ever i think the one letdown in the design is the dungeon design occasionally can be a little bland um there are certain ones that are just a series of tunnels in a cave that are on one hand intentionally discombobulating like that you they they want you to get lost but uh with the top down view of this game it makes them also look like you're just walking on like a platform floating in space which is a little bit of a disappointment to me it's still not like something to, that i would say is bad it's just maybe not as good as it could be starting with music i love the music in this game it is so unlike anything else. Like many video games, this uses themes, but it uses them in a different way. They're like little short motives that get woven into it. So like a lot of the times when there's something weird happening or when you're facing a weird enemy, there's this motive that you hear in one of the synthesizers that sort of becomes another clue that just something weird is going on, but it also just works so well with the world building. There's another really simple little mel melodic motif that goes bum, 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 bum. And that's it. And it happens at different speeds and stuff, but it's in like so many tracks. And when it appears in a track, it's something that is like safe and home and comforting. Actually, the music playing in the background of this is all the things that sort of tie into that feel. I partially chose all of the different tracks that I put in this melody because they're all in G major, but also they all are something that feels like home and comfort. And I think that is really smart how even the key that all of these things are in fit together. This is not a very melody focused score. Like the writing, it's all about the vibes. I don't know, it, it just all fits so well and it's fun. There's a lot of really cool things like cool sampling happening, shouts and people talking and radio static. I forgot to look up who composed this game. They did an excellent job, but this score is so good. I agree with everything you said. The only thing I have to add is I think one of the cool things about the music in this game is that it's so unstructured. I mean, you alluded to it when you said there's no melody, but also there is often no beat in a lot of the music. It's like drone layered on top of drone with an occasional motif scooped in there, but really there's no steady beat. I can't think of a single other console role-playing game soundtrack where that's the case. And look, I listen to a lot of console role-playing game soundtracks, okay? And this game, it's just like, I mean, atonal is the wrong word. There's, there's so little structure in the music. And I think that's one of the things that makes it feel so immersive. And yet there are also a few beautiful moments too. Or like the final boss music is some of the most t genuinely terrifying music I've heard in any game. Moving on to sound effects. I don't have a ton to say about the sound effects, but they are similarly charming. The little like smash sound effect and... <laughs> Yeah, and uh, you know, if one of your characters falls in battle, you're this <laughs> It's just, it's like effective, but also not scary. It's like, you can come back from this. I love the battle mechanics in this game, even though a lot of it really owes to other earlier games. One thing I really love is the way that time is managed in battles, because you do have enough time to think about what you want to do, but not to really ponder. And I love the rolling like slot number mechanic of like that attack just hits you and you know you're going to die. But if you act really fast, you might be able to do something about it. And the drama of watching your HP counting down after that hit is like so intense to me. One thing I don't love though is to me, this game has a too many random battles. 
ones. It starts to feel like a bit of a slog to get through. And most of the time in this game, I feel challenged for the right reasons. But sometimes I feel challenged for the wrong reasons. Uh, like my characters are just exhausted and you haven't really given me enough of an opportunity to get recovery items, for example. The game is a little stingy with money, which is not a big deal. And this game also, if I remember correctly, really doesn't reward grinding. You do have to grind kind of a lot in this game because the difficulty ramps up pretty fast. But I think in one way, it's nice that you don't gain a lot of money from battles because it's sort of like, okay, well, if I'm going to move on to this next dungeon, I want to have all of the best equipment I can afford. It'll take me a while to get all that money. But you also need all that experience because each new dungeon is considerably more difficult than the last for the most part in this game i don't mind challenges in games but i do mind a little bit when it feels like it's a challenge that i can't really do anything about and there are moments in this game where it feels like there wasn't really anything i could do to prepare for this and it sort of feels like kicking in a man when he's down what we were saying about the rolling HP in this game. For the most part, it's a good thing. It works both ways. If you heal yourself, your HP actually also slowly rolls up. So that's a good time to pause and wait for it to get all the way up before the next attack. But many random encounters in this game, when an enemy dies, it explodes or it bursts into flames or something and casts usually lethal damage to the people that it hits. On one hand, it's absolutely terrifying. And it's like, I'm just going to take a lot of damage in this battle. There's nothing I can do about it. And so that plays into like not having enough curative elements and things like that that you were saying earlier. But on the other hand, it's adding a different layer of strategy to the battles that like, okay, that's the one that explodes. I have to kill that one last, kill everything else first so the battle can end and the scrolling can stop before the battle ends and everyone will survive. You're still going to have to heal them a lot because it's still going to do a lot of damage. And this game is not afraid of throwing these difficulty curveballs at you. To that end, I think the difficulty is a little unfriendly in this game. Like you, I don't mind difficult, but I really like in JRPGs being able to grind to a point that battles are easy at the end. You know, it's just a balancing thing that I think sometimes the developers didn't get right. Our points when we were going through everything gave this game a score of 90%. I thought this game deserved a 94%. Ramin thought the game deserved a 95%. By those powers combined, this game is Captain Planet and gets a score of 93%, which I think is about spot on. And much like Captain Planet, the most important element of all is heart. Yeah. <laughs> if someone has not played this game before, but they like RPGs, what are you going to say to get them to play it? This game is unlike almost any other RPG you will probably play. And having played RPGs, you probably know enough to get through it successfully, but there are still plenty of curveballs. Yeah, I think one of the most satisfying and exciting things about this game is what it does with the narrative that is sort of a tropey narrative. But the way it works in this game is it's really satisfying. This is where the game is compared to other games that we've reviewed. I know I keep using the word understated, but I've played video games all my life and I am a right 35 years old. What I've noticed is the trend has in these kinds of games, in console role-playing games, generally has been bigger louder, more colorful, sexier, more violent, and that's fine. I can't sit here and pretend that I don't like a good colorful graphic or like a good explosive combat, but when I think about games like Earthbound, it does make me a little nostalgic in a sad way. This game is beautiful because it's so soft, like it's so quiet and subtle in the way that it expresses its ideas. I believe in Never Say Never, but I'm finding it really hard to believe that we're going to get back to that place in video games. I play D&D a lot and I run D&D games a lot, and one habit I work to break in my own work in that is avoiding telling a player how their character is feeling instead of just letting the player tell me how they feel. This game does that better than I think any game I can name. And I think that's why it strikes such a chord in people's hearts 
the people who like it. It trusts you to do that work. It's been said a lot that the more personal and specific to a person a song is, usually the more universal it actually is for the audience. And I think in this case, that's true for the way this game expresses itself. It's funny that this game reads visually like a cartoon, but narratively, it doesn't. It reads more like a, a slice of life story or something. Yeah, when you were talking about the simpler design of this game, it got me thinking about things like slice of life games, like farming sims and dating sims and stuff like that. And I think there's an interesting parallel with Earthbound, at least in aesthetics, not really in storytelling or anything like that. There's something that's down home and comforting about Earthbound in a way that a good slice of life or dating sim can be. I am curious what someone who does not play JRPGs but does play those type of games might think about Earthbound. It might be too difficult of a first RPG for many people. It might strike a different chord with some people. We should probably get to wrapping this up. It's been fun chatting with you about this game that we both love so much. Seek this game out. Original hard copies of the game are so expensive. So emulate this, play it on Switch. Play it on whichever one of the uh, Nintendo handhelds has it. Play this game, it's so good. <laughs> As someone whose lowest score was the difficulty level, it's worth getting through it for the end. There's a lot of good parts of the game, but the ending is, in my opinion, the best part. It's it's worth the slog. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, please leave a comment on what your thoughts on this game are. Did we share any opinions that you differ on? I want to hear about them. I want to have a conversation with you about them. The vast majority of our commenters are great, and I love responding to you and reading your thoughts, so please let us know. Give this video a like if you liked it. Give it a pity like if you didn't like it. Please subscribe to our channel. We talk about mostly video games and music, but sometimes some other stuff. And that's about it. Thank you so much for watching. See you next time. Maintain your groovy selves.